Grab your knitting. It's time for Saturday night at the movies. Junkies, welcome back to The Color Cauldron. I'm Johanna, the owner and dyer behind Potion Yarns and host of this podcast. Today we have another Saturday night at the movies where we take a film that features fiber arts in some way, knitting, crochet, embroidery, sewing, or just a reference to wool or something along those lines, and we give a quick review, talk about where we find our fiber in the film, and then we pair it with a pattern that either reminds us of the film or is featured in the movie or is just kind of generally inspired by the era, style, etc. It's a lot of fun and it's a great way to find new films to watch as well as good um, ideas for maybe a knitting or fiber movie night with friends. Today Baby Potion is joining us off camera so you might hear his adorable little interjections from time to time. Um, but hopefully we can get through this movie while he is happily playing in his little bouncer seat with toys. Today we have a little bit of a cheater film, and uh, the reason I'm including it is because it's just a fun movie anyways, and I just sort of stumbled upon this great film on accident just the other night looking for something to watch um, while I was nursing the baby and hanging out, and I thought it would be really fun to incorporate this on our show because it's a movie that's not a well-known classic film, so even if you're into old movies like I am, you maybe haven't seen this one before, or maybe it's been a while since you saw it, and I thought it would be fun to bring it out. The reason it's a cheater film is because there is a reference to knitting in the movie. However, it's just referenced in some dialogue. We don't actually see anyone doing any knitting or crochet or sewing or anything like that. But it's a fun movie and there's a reference to knitting, so I decided we would go ahead and do it. So the film is 1947's Her Husband's Affairs. It features the lovely Lucille Ball, better known in I Love Lucy fame. The classic television show that a lot of us grew up watching, and her co-star is the handsome, debonair, and suave Franchot Tome. You may not be familiar with this guy, but uh, he was actually quite popular during the 1930s and 40s. He was an actor who generally was in films where he played more of like a, a dashing leading man, a romantic interest, um, more of serious drama films um, or like soap opera -y kind of films. But he did do quite a few comedies in the 1940s and uh, just like this one. And he was actually pretty good at it, which was probably a bit of a surprise to his audience that got used to him in roles um, like when he played one of the sailors in Mutiny on the Bounty and things like that. So they are kind of an odd pairing because French Choton was like I said, more of a, a drama, soap opera, classic leading man, um, but not one of the better known ones like Cary Grant or someone. And uh, Lucille Ball, at this point in her career, this is 1947, remember, so it's before I Love Lucy fame. Um, however, she was getting quite famous and popular already in her own right as a comedian. So this is one of her many comedies that she did during that era. Um, and I love Lucy in the late 40s. I think that was probably her heyday. Obviously the 1950s is when she really got famous as I Love Lucy, but I really love her in the 1940s right before she launched into that TV show because I think she's at the height of her beauty, I think she's at the height of her, her rising comedy powers and she would really honed her comedic skills, um, but she was still young and fresh and exciting and plus I just personally love the 1940s, it's kind of my favorite era, so uh, she has just amazing hair and clothes and awesome everything in this movie. So I'm a little prejudiced because I love the 40s, but I really think she's at her peak comedic powers about this time anyways, right before she got into I Love Lucy. This is called Her Husband's Affairs because on the outset it's about a husband and wife clashing over her meddling in his affairs. Not the romantic type, his business affairs, his just life affairs, his success. So we have a husband and wife, Fresh Tone and Lucille Ball. He's an advertising executive and he is in a pretty good career, but we find out early on in the film that all through his career and all through their marriage, she has interjected into his affairs. She's kind of helped direct him, helped guide him, and she's been a good luck charm for him. A lot of his success is due to her and her helping to direct things, giving him ideas, suggestions, etc. Um, and in the very beginning of the film, when I very first started watching it, I was a little put off because uh, one of the opening scenes, he's uh, coming up with advertising slogan ideas, and she suggests something that is clearly better than what he has, and he really kind of gives her the little, like, 
okay, little woman, don't don't interject into my, this. that's not your job. You take care of the house and let me do the man's work of coming up with the slogans. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like so stereotypically sexist. And I don't normally buy into that rhetoric, but oh my gosh, this is, this is why people have the view, the flat unidimensional view of the 50s as like women weren't allowed to do anything. And so it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. But you quickly come to see as you watch the film that the reason he reacts so poorly, and it is shown to be a poor reaction, the reason that he reacts so poorly is because he has a major chip on his shoulder and kind of like a complex about her being the reason that he's successful. He knows that she has really helped him in his career and really helped get him where he's going. And so it's kind of made him feel a little bit less of a man. And so he's got a little bit of a an identity crisis going on. Um, not that that excuses it, and that's kind of the point of the film, is they show in comedy style that um, he's really reacting poorly and his poor reactions make their marriage even worse and cause a lot of the issues that they both face in the film. But also her meddling, she really does, in the beginning, you're like, oh, this poor little woman, she's really right though, she's smart, she's, he should listen to her. Yes, but you also see how she oversteps from time to time and she really starts to interject and um, in ways that she shouldn't and to the point where she's almost like mothering him and it's kind of an unhealthy relationship because she's supposed to be his wife, not his mother and so there are times that it's like you really need to back off and let him make his own mistakes, let him learn and grow and let him come to you and ask for advice instead of just always interjecting. So in the end, I came away with it feeling like it was a really well-rounded um, it's done all in comedy and lighthearted, so there's no like in-depth examination of this, but I really got the message that um, there is the surface level, yes, he is being kind of a chauvinist about it and not really letting her um, show off her gifts and talents, but also she's overstepping, and neither one of them is right. They both need to change their approach, change their attitudes, and work together as a team instead of um, competing in their marriage. So uh, in this film, we see that going on early on, um, and he's working at this advertising firm, and his boss has a new account that they need uh, slogans and advertising for, and the boss has already had experience in the past with his wife interjecting and um, basically saving his bacon, like saving accounts, giving greater, great ideas or fixing things that he, he has an idea and it starts to go awry and she manages to fix it and kind of put a twist on it. She's a great salesperson, so she's able to put twists on his ideas and make it work. And so the boss is like, well, why don't we just leave it up to your wife? Like, you guys are a great team, but basically is contributing to this man's identity crisis by like kind of patting him on the head and being like, oh, okay, but your wife is really, really great and offers her a job at the same advertising firm. So really kind of pits them against each other in this competitive kind of feel. So they're always trying to come up with this get-rich-quick scheme and they team up with this guy named Glinka who's like a mad scientist and they did... <laughs> you are making me laugh so... Sorry, baby potion is distracting me. They team up with this mad scientist named Glinka and um, he's trying to develop a product for a customer and basically they want to come up with a serum that men would rub on their faces and it would keep their hair from growing back so you don't have to shave anymore. It's like a permanent um, depilatory, basically. I really hope none of that is on the film. <laughs> so they think they've hit on this magic formula. It really seems to be working. They try it out. The men who try it are like, oh my gosh, my face has never been so smooth. It's wonderful. So they go ahead and get this whole like press conference organized with all these ho high profile people coming and they get all of these men with beards or hair or like hairy moles or something else to come and try out the serum on their faces and they all rub it on for the press and then like wipe off the hair and it's like oh my gosh their faces are so smooth you just rub it on wipe it off and it's gone no more razor burn all this stuff so um the next morning as they're planning the release of this wonderful product that they've already had the press conference for and everything else they discover that there's a little bit of a bug in the product they didn't test it before they did the press release, and now all these people that put the cream on their face have hair growing back, and not only is it the hair they had before, it's almost like a hair growth regeneration serum, because now they've got these bushy full beards, and it's this terrible disaster, and they're trying to convince the press not to uh, put it out there, and all these other things, um, and it's this terrible disaster. 
then Lucille Ball comes in and figures out, oh, hey, why don't we just change who we're marketing it for, change the name of it, and instead of marketing it as a no-shave cream, we market it to bald men, and they put it on their head, and suddenly they have all this glorious hair and all of this stuff. So once again, she saves his bacon, and rather than being grateful to his wife, he's resentful because he feels like she's the only one who ever comes up with good ideas, and it just makes him feel inferior and stupid, and he doesn't ever get the chance to fix his own mistakes because she thinks on her feet quicker than he does, and she manages to fix it and all this stuff. I'm not going to spoil the rest of the film for you and tell you what happens, but let's just say they go from frying pan to fire, um, more and more crazy schemes, more and more things going wrong, and it just ends up as hilarious hijinks, completely unrealistic hilarious hijinks. And if nothing else, the lesson of the film is don't plan a press release or start advertising or talking about a brand new product until you've thoroughly tested it beforehand. <laughs> because they don't make that mistake just once in the film, they make it over and over. And by the end, you're like, really? No one thinks that we should test this before we just announce to the newspapers that we've got this great new product that does XYZ? But that's why it's a comedy, I guess. <laughs> So, it's a fun, silly little film. Now, where is the fiber reference? Like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, there is only a reference in passing to knitting. There's not an actual knitting scene. And um, I was slightly distracted um, playing with Baby Potion while I was watching it, so you can let me know if I'm wrong about this, but I didn't see any like great knitwear that anyone was wearing either. It's possible because it was the 40s and knitwear was quite popular at the time, but um, I didn't actually see any. But let me know if you find one. Um, so the reference to knitting is just in a line, and um, it's the stereotypical old stick to your knitting line because basically Lucille Ball is trying to help her husband before he crashes and burns with yet another failed idea um, that he hasn't thoroughly thought through yet. And she, rather than trying to either gently guide him or wait for him to ask her advice, she comes in and just starts trying to fix everything while he's still trying to get the idea off the ground and he gets frustrated with her and tells her that she needs to go home and stick to her knitting basically. So um, obviously a large fight ensues after that comment. <laughs> but um, while it's not the most positive reference to knitting in the film and it's a little bit derogatory not only to his wife but also to um, knitters everywhere. So I was a little bit miffed that they went with that old stereotype. At the same time it's a reference to knitting and it's a fun film so I decided we'd include it. Plus, as a hairstylist or a former hairstylist, I'm obsessed with vintage hair, as you might be able to tell, and I love getting new ideas and just looking to see what's in all these great old movies, and uh, Lucille Ball's hair in this film is on point. So if nothing else, even if you hate the movie and think it's dumb and boring and silly, um, which it is really silly, uh, her hairstyles are definitely worth a watch. As with all Saturday Night at the Movies films, I really like to pair a knitting or crochet pattern with the film that we are reviewing. Now, full disclosure, this is a little bit of a cheater one for me as well, um, because I have not actually knit the pattern that I'm going to recommend to you, so take that with a grain of salt. I have not done the work of knitting it and seeing um, how well it's written, how easy it is to follow, what level I would rate it at, etc. All of those things. I just picked a pattern that I haven't knit, but it reminded me of something that Lucille Ball might have worn in the film and what was popular uh, in knitting patterns in the late 1940s after World War II, and I decided that we would use that as our recommended pattern. Now I have knit something very, very similar to this pattern, so I'll talk about that in a minute. The pattern that we are going to be recommending this month, that hopefully you guys will knit and let me know how easy they are and whether or not they're any fun, because they look awesome and they're on my list of things that would be fun to try sometime, are the Open Work Gloves. Hopefully you can see this picture okay. Um, these are just little uh, lightweight, vintage style, ladylike gloves. So you knit individual fingers for all of them. And uh, you could cut the fingers off, I suppose, and make them fingerless mitts, but um, they're meant to be little gloves. These were really, really popular from the 1930s through the 1950s, but especially in the 40s era, right around World War II and after the war, these were a really popular knitting pattern. They became popular during the war because they took small amounts of wool, so even with rationing or unraveling old sweaters, you could easily find enough um, to make your little uh, finger or your little gloves. Um, even with the rations going on and when wool was in scarce supply, but they also were very popular because during the 1940s and especially in the 50s, 
going out of the house without gloves was almost unthinkable for a properly dressed woman and so they would have gloves oftentimes in the 1950s they got really into matching their gloves shoes and hats as well as any um, like belts or purses in the 40s they were a little bit less matchy matchy but there were still oftentimes the the gloves would often match their shoes and or hat, um, or if they didn't exactly match, they were definitely into coordinating accessories. So um, gloves were a big thing in the 40s and 50s, and so every lady would want to have at least a few pairs of gloves. These ones are great because since they are knit with wool, they are actually warm as well as decorative. Some of the gloves from that era were purely decorative. These ones are really beautiful and decorative, but they are actually warm as well, so they are practical and serve the purpose, which was another reason they got very popular in the 1940s when not everybody had um, really warm houses. They didn't have uh, central heating back then, most of them, and uh, they didn't have a lot of the amenities that we're used to today, like heat in their cars and things. So you would definitely wanna make sure that your fingers were well protected when you went out in the winter. Now this is actually done with a lace weight yarn so that you can get really fine detail on the stitches and it also makes them really, really lightweight, um, but still very warm because it is wool. I would choose a wool or a wool blend. I believe in this pattern they use a wool, um, yeah, they use a baby alpaca and merino wool blend, which is going to be absolutely soft as can be, plus it's gonna be really, really warm and a little bit hairy, um, which you can actually see if you look really, really close at the picture. This pattern comes from a book called A Hand Knit Romance, and I'll put a link to that below so you can find the book. I highly recommend the entire book. It is absolutely stunning, uh, but I will give you the caveat, this is not really a beginner-friendly book. This is more intermediate and advanced. There are some simple, easy patterns in it, so um, it's not that you couldn't get into it if you're a beginner, but most of the patterns work with lace weight, or um, even crochet thread or fingering weight. So there are much lighter, smaller yarns, which can be difficult and intimidating for beginner knitters. Although certainly I would never tell someone not to try that. If you're drawn to those things, you might enjoy it. And um, they're not any harder than knitting with um, bulkier yarns, even though people seem to think they are. Um, but they can be a little bit intimidating. And one of the main reasons most beginners don't like to start with finer yarns is they tend to take longer to, um, to make. Here is another picture of the gloves that we are featuring from this book, the open work gloves. Uh, they have this little pretty button detail at the wrist, which you could leave off, but why would you? It's so sweet and very, very vintage. And I love that it has the little um, contrast border right at the cuff. It's just a row or two of contrast color. Really excellent detail. These are the kinds of details that set vintage work apart from um, not that modern patterns don't have those kinds of things, but it really sets your knitting and crochet projects apart when you have those lovely little details like that, and that's a very vintagey kind of feature. So basically, it's just a stockinette glove, and then you have this lacy openwork pattern on the back of your hand, which is really, really nice. And then, like we said, you've got that pretty button detail contrasting on the cuff, and it looks like there's a bit of a lacy cuff as well, so that it's got that pretty little elegant, graceful feel. Um, I do believe, I don't, I don't know if you can purchase this pattern singly by itself. Um, you could definitely look it up um, and I will put the name of the pattern in the description box as well, um, plus the link to the book. So you can purchase the book. I highly recommend that, especially if you're into vintage looks or lightweight yarns, or you can just purchase the gloves. Um, and I did want to show you, she has, I love this book because she has all the inspiration pictures. Um, this ranges from uh, like early 1900s style up through the 1950s. So she's got like 1900s and World War I patterns and 20s style patterns in it as well. Um, but she always includes a little vintage inspiration picture so you can see where she got her ideas for the patterns. And so this one has this really beautiful picture from the 1940s of like hand knit stockings and gloves. There's some fair isle gloves and then these ones are the little lacy open work gloves. They look a little bit more simple than the ones she has here, but same kind of idea. And then they both have hand-knit stockings as well, which would have been thicker than like your nylons and stuff like that, more for winter wear. So really, really beautiful. If you're thinking about the book um, and you're really into vintage style, after that beautiful inspiration photo, I will say there is a pattern for hand-knit stockings in here as well. So you might want to check that out. Um, but like I said, I haven't actually knit this pattern. I have done something really similar to this. It was many years before I had my business, so no idea I was gonna have the podcast or anything, so I don't have them anymore to show you because it was a little bit of a disaster. So I'm gonna share my story, and hopefully it will help you avoid disaster on your gloves. 
So I had a glove pattern and it was from some magazine way back in the day. I don't even remember which one, but there was a pattern for basically the same kind of a thing, but it was more complex lace. So rather than just a little lacy pattern and a stockinette glove, it was um, kind of like a plain background for a little while, but then the entire back of the hand was this very intricate open work like lace on every round pattern. So it was very, very lacy and it was really complex patterning too. It was a really advanced pattern. Um, and even on the palm, the palm part was stockinette, but like the cuff and the fingers were all like pattern stitches. They weren't just stockinette. Um, so that made it more complex. And then um, it was very, very fiddly. It was in lace weight yarn. And I was also very inexperienced at the time. I didn't have, um, the access to a great podcast like Color Cauldron that talks about different types of wool and what they're good for. And I had not read a lot of the books that I read not long after this fiasco um, that already gave information about wool. So I was, I was very uneducated about wool and different types of yarn. And so I had a skein of Malabrigo single ply lace weight which I had found at a flea market marked down and I recognized the Malabrigo and it was gorgeous colors and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they don't know what they have. They're selling it so cheap. It's like five bucks. I'm going to grab this skein. It was still in the hang, hadn't even been wound. Um, so I scored big time and I was so excited and then I hoarded the yarn for several months trying to decide what to make and I found this glove pattern and had exactly the yarn that I needed. So I decided to go ahead and um, try it or I should say I had the exact amount of yarn I needed, not the type of yarn, that's what went wrong. At the time, I did not know what single ply was. I could tell that the yarn was fluffier and looked different than other lace weights I had that were like two ply or more, um, but I did not know what those terms meant. I had done zero spinning and I didn't know anything about plies in yarn or why that mattered. And so I just thought this yarn's really soft and it's really gorgeous colors and it's the right weight of yarn. This calls for a lace weight and it, is the right yardage. So I'm going to substitute this yarn for the one they have in the pattern and use it. And technically, people who are big fans of single ply will tell you that single ply is fine for gloves and fingerless mitts, but my experience was that it was not. While I was knitting, it was perfectly fine. It was soft, it was gorgeous. It showed off the lace pattern beautifully. I loved it, I fell in love. It took me four freaking ever to knit those dang gloves. And um, I almost gave up several times because the pattern was quite complicated, but I pressed on, I finally got it done, and they looked phenomenal, and I was so proud of them. And I put them on my hands and drove to work at the hair salon feeling so gorgeous and beautiful. And I literally wore those gloves two times. Two, count them one, two. And the palm was so felted and matted together from being on the steering wheel driving. And I wasn't like driving like an hour. I was driving like 10 minutes to my job and 10 minutes home, maybe a stop to pick up gas or something. That's it, two days and they were completely matted so that the yarn was like pilling and shredding and it was, it just looked horrible, awful. I cried, I cussed, and then I threw them in the trash and I never looked back. And then I took the magazine, the pattern came in and I threw that in the trash too. So I can't even tell you what magazine it was or what pattern it was or anything. <laughs> so lesson learned, that was the day that I began to hate with fiery passion, single ply. It was years and years before I had the gumption to try a single ply shawl because I still had single ply in my stash that I hadn't knit. So I finally tried a shawl and realized it's wonderful for shawls and it can be great for other things. Like I said, some people will knit gloves with it. Some people will knit sweaters with it. I personally don't have the guts to try that. I'm going to try a sweater one of these days, but I'm terrified that it's going to be like the gloves and as soon as you wear them, it's just gonna mat together. Now, to be fair, I don't know if that is because it was single ply or because it was Malabrigo's specific single ply, or maybe I just got a dud skein. I haven't actually used any Malabrigo lace since then either, so I can't compare it and know if I just got a bad skein or an old skein that wasn't stored properly, or if it was actually like, they just have a crappy base yarn and other people's single ply lace weight would be fine. I don't know any of that. There's so many variables that could have gone into that, which is why I have tried single ply since then, and I recommend that you do too, but definitely don't ever use it for socks, and I wouldn't use it for gloves or anything if you're gonna be using your hands a lot. Now, if you're just putting your gloves on and you're gonna sit quietly while someone else drives you to church, and then you're going to take them off gently, and that's all you're gonna do with them, single ply is probably fine, but if you're actually driving or using your hands while wearing your gloves like I do, you may want to look into something else. So don't use single ply on your open work gloves is basically what I'm telling you. Use two ply or more. <laughs>
All right, I hope that that gives you some fun inspiration. I hope that gives you a fun film to watch. The great thing about this movie, I will add, there is a link in the description box below because uh, this is, as of this filming, it is free to watch on YouTube. I hope you guys have a wonderful time knitting 40s inspired gloves or whatever your heart desires while you watch that great movie. And it is now time to cast off. Love you.